John chapter 11 records the raising of Lazarus from the dead. And while I want to deal with some of the details of that event, I really want to get past that to what actually happens after Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. And that's the reason for the title on this particular video. It's an extremely abbreviated part of a statement made by Caiaphas, the high priest, during the ministry of Jesus. One man for the nation has left a lot of words out of what he actually states, but we'll get to that in a few moments. In the 11th chapter, the very beginning, verses 1 through 4, Jesus receives word from Mary and Martha that Lazarus is very, very ill. And in verse number 6, the statement is made concerning the actions of Jesus. When he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. And then verse 7, after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. Uh, the situation, Lazarus is a very ill. The decision of Jesus, let's stay here two more days. Notice the reaction of the disciples. Verse 8, the disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you, and are you going there again? And after conversation, in which they really don't understand all the details, Jesus finally tells them very plainly down in verse number 14, Lazarus is dead. Then verse 15, Jesus says this, And I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. Verse number 16, Then Thomas, who is called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. They know the danger. We talked about it before. The very beginning of John chapter 7, the Jews were seeking to kill Jesus. This has been going on for some time. And Jesus has been avoiding the area of Judea, but he goes back. And then when he arrives, down in verse 17, when Jesus came and found that they'd already, he'd already been in the tomb four days, and there's a conversation that takes place between Jesus and Martha. Martha says, if you'd been here, verse 21, my brother would not have died. And Jesus says in verse 23, your brother will rise again. Tremendous story. Shortest verse New Testament is found in this chapter. Jesus wept. Jesus asked for the stone to be removed from the front of the tomb, although the sisters really are, are concerned. In fact, Martha makes a statement, by this time there's a stench where he's been dead for four days. But they remove the stone from the opening of the tomb, and Jesus calls with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Now after that happens, verse 45 Many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had, been, had seen the things Jesus did believed in him. Verse 46, But some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things Jesus did. So some believe, some report. And as 40, verse 47, the observation of the religious leadership is this. The chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, What shall we do? For this man works many signs. The idea of Maybe considering the fact that he is who he claims to be, that's not going to cross their mind at all. It's like, we've got to do something to stop this, but we don't know what we're going to do. In fact, the concern is something that's stated in verse 48. If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. And a lot of commentaries that you read about this particular verse, the statement is, well, from taking away our place, it just means that the Romans will destroy the temple. You have to think about what's involved in the Romans destroying the temple. These individuals that make their livelihood this way will lose their authority, lose their prominence, lose the prestige they have among the people. Uh, they're not going to be individuals that can actually gain the attention of the Roman authorities. It's like we're losing everything that we have fought for to have. We do not want the status quo to change at all. And then Caiaphas makes a statement. Caiaphas, the high priest, verse 49. This is what he says. You know nothing at all, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and not that the whole nation should perish. One man for the nation. So what are you suggesting? Let's murder somebody to keep the nation safe. What's he done? Well, he's really called us out on things that we have not been teaching 
or things that we've been teaching in, in really false ways. We've been focusing on the traditions of the rabbis rather than what the law of God actually said. I think one of those commandments in the Ten Commandments was, Thou shalt not murder. Older King James says, Thou shalt not kill. Another one was about bearing false witness, which is exactly what they're going to do to actually get this job of killing Jesus accomplished. So the statement that's made, if we let him alone, the Romans are going to come and take away our place and our nation. Which is more significant in the minds of these individuals? Is it the nation? Is it the Romans are going to destroy Judea? No, it's that the Romans are going to take away our place. Our place and our nation. We'll do anything we can to hold on to power. You read through this story, and although this is a religious setting, the similarities between this part of John chapter 11 and things this nation has been going through are very, very obvious. We'll leave that point at that. The question would be asked, is Jesus a threat to the nation? He's a threat to the pompousness of the religious leaders. He's a threat to the hypocrisy that exists among them. He's a threat to the way that these leaders have actually made the nation subservient to them. But is he a threat to the nation? If we let him alone, the Romans are going to come and take away our place in our nation. Would that happen? So, question to ask is, what did Jesus teach concerning the way that we view those in positions of authority? What did he actually express? To begin with, in, um, in Matthew chapter 20, verse 25 and verse 26, Jesus says this, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, over the Gentiles, and those who are great exercise authority over them, yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. What a novel idea. People in positions of authority and power being servants of the people around them. That really doesn't fit the religious leaders of Jesus' day. That really doesn't fit a lot of leaders in general in a lot of generations. Again, take a look at today. So the statement that Jesus makes about authority is that if you're in a position of authority, you're there to serve, not to be served. Go from chapter 20 of Matthew, just a couple chapters after that, to chapter 23. Beginning in verse 1, I want to kind of hit some high points from 1 down through verse 11. Jesus spoke to the multitudes and said to the disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, seat of authority. Verse 3, Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do, but do not do according to their works, for they say and do not do. They bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. Two sets of rules. One's, one is for them and one's for you. I guess who has the better deal. Verse number 5, All their works they do to be seen by men. They want the accolades around them, prestige and prominence. Verse number six, they love the best places at, the, at feast, the best seats in the synagogues, greetings in the marketplace, and be called by men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But you do not be called Rabbi, for one is your teacher, the Christ, and you are all brethren. Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. Do not be called a teacher, for one is your teacher, the Christ. Verse 11, he who is greatest among you, shall be your servant. There's that idea again. Go from Matthew over to Luke. Luke chapter 20. Beginning in verse 9, Jesus uses a parable to make a very significant point. It's a parable of an individual that's a landowner, and he hires tenants to come in and work the land. And then at harvest time, he sends some of his people over to the tenant farmers to, to get some of the produce. Actually, they've been working the land, but it's his land. He deserves some of that produce. They beat up the ones that are sent. The owner sends other people. They beat those up as well. And finally, the owner says, I'll send my son, verse 13. Probably they will respect him when they see him. But in verse 14, when, they, when those who are working the land see the son, they reason among themselves, saying, This is the heir. 
Come, let us kill him, that the inheritance may be ours. So they cast him out of the, out of the vineyard, killed him. Therefore, Jesus asked, What will the owner of the vineyard do to them? Verse 16, He will come and destroy those who are working the land and give that land to others. In verse 19, the chief priests and the scribes that very hour sought to lay hands on Jesus, but they feared the people, for they knew that Jesus had spoken this parable against them. When somebody gets called out for hypocrisy, nobody likes that. And if it's not true, then it's, a, it's, it's something that's easy to defend and e easy to actually prove the opposite. But if it's true, what do people do? Oh, they become angry and upset and do anything they can to eradicate the person that pointed it out. That's what happens here. So in verse number 20, they watched him. They sent spies who pretended to be righteous that they might seize on his words in order to deliver him to the power and the authorities of the governor. Interesting motive. It's a hypocritical motive. It's a devious motive. It's an evil motive. It's a wicked motive. Not bespeaking, not, not actually something that should be found in anybody that is in a position of authority. Verse number 21, they ask him, saying, Teacher, we know that you say and teach rightly and that you do not show personal favoritism, but teach the way of God in truth. False flattery, verse 21. Verse 22, is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? It's a question that's asked to entrap what Jesus will say, something that they can use to accuse him. But he, perceiving their craftiness, their deviousness, said to them, Why do you test me? Show me a denarius. Whose image and inscription does it have? They answered and said, Caesar's. And Jesus says to them, Render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. The teaching of Jesus on service, honesty, humility, justice, truth, honor, nothing that Jesus taught would jeopardize the nation. What jeopardized the nation? Those that were in positions of authority who are using that authority in unscrupulous ways. Interesting, interesting events, interesting story in John chapter 11. I want you to get past the raising of Lazarus in the first two-thirds of John chapter 11. The rest of it is very intriguing because it tips the hand of those who should be living in righteous ways and serving the people, but they're doing nothing of the sort. Again, read the chapter again and compare it, not in a religious way or maybe even religious ways, but compare it to things that you're reading in today's paper and see if similarities exist. Please stay safe. We'll talk again soon.